the question reads in a study of the relation between the amount of information available and use of buses in eight comparable cities bus route maps were given to a residents of the cities at the big at the beginning of the test period the increase in the average daily bus use during the test period was recorded the number of maps and the increase in bus use are given in the table below both in thousands number of maps okay so they have given us summation x summation x square summation y summation y square summation x y these kind of information are always given in the question so that you don't need to calculate those values construct a scatter plot diagram and comment on the relationship between the increase in the bus bus use and the number of maps distributed now how would you recognize whether this sum is of correlation regression first of all we'll have two variables x and y the number of terms given will always be equal so you can see the number of x's and number of y's are equal and you can see one is causing the other here in the question they are asking that does the number of maps uh, you know distributed increases the bus use or not so this becomes a correlation regression sum so scatter plot diagram is one way we can talk about the correlation between two terms then second part is the equation of the fitted line regression is given by this. okay first what we'll do is first we'll uh, concentrate on the scatter plot diagram and then comment on the relationship between the increase in bus use and the number of maps distributed x will be denoted on x axis y will be denoted on y axis so this is the scatter plot diagram we can clearly see there is definitely a relationship it might be linear but it mostly looks it is a curved relationship so anyways we can make a linear relationship uh, in the question after uh, the scatter plot diagram we need to comment on the relationship between the increase in the bus use and the number of maps distributed so basically we can say that there is a positive correlation between those two values second part the equation of the fitted line regression is given by this particular line uh, perform an appropriate statistical test to assess the hypothesis that the slope in this fitted model suggests no relationship between the increase in the bus use uh, and the number of maps distributed any assumption made should be clearly stated here they are asking us to assess the hypothesis that the slope in the fitted model suggest no relationship between the uh, statistical uh, between the increase in the bus and the number of maps so basically they are talking about the beta so we are going to say that the beta is equal to 0 because if beta is 0 r will also be zero we had a relationship between beta and r we had beta is equals to r into under root of i think s y y by s x x so if r is zero beta is zero beta is zero r is zero so if we check whether beta is zero that means there is no relationship between these two so because they have asked to assess using the slope of the fitted model that is why we are going to check whether beta is zero or not that the beta that we have using this equation beta hat is given as 0.04348 in our line equation now we know our test statistic we have beta hat minus beta upon under root of sigma hat square by s x x follows t n minus 2 so here we'll need to find sigma hat square we'll need to find s x x for sigma hat square we'll again need s x uh, y and i guess s uh, y y just use your table formula book and find those values 
So first of all, we'll have S X X. That is nothing but summation X square minus summation X whole square by N. Now I guess in the table formula book go book they have given us summation x square minus x bar square into n. These two are the same thing. They have just substituted x bar square or x bar as summation x by n. So we can do it this way or this this way. Anyways, the values that are given summation x square, summation x, and all of those values you will be using and. I'll just start writing down the values. So now this part you don't have to write. This is just for your explanation. So you'll have to find all of these values. Then your hypothesis will be h naught that beta is equals to zero. Your h one will be that beta not equal to zero because they have not said to test whether beta is greater than zero or beta is less than zero. So it will be Not equal to zero. So our test statistic substitute all those values. Find your t observed. Now degrees of freedom is n minus two. So there were eight different values. So therefore. N minus two becomes six. Then find your t six comma zero point zero two five, or you can just write twenty two point five percent. You can write it as t two point five percent comma six. This is from our tables. We have two point four four seven. Now clearly, our t observed is greater than our t, so we can say that we have enough evidence to reject our H naught. Hence, our uh, correlation is not zero, or correlation coefficient is not zero, or you can say that our beta is not zero. Uh, we are going to just read the question. They are saying no re uh, su suggest no relationship. So write down your final conclusion using those values. That there is a relationship between the increase in bus use and non uh, number of maps distributed. Then they have also said any assumptions made should be clearly stated. So here, what we are assuming is the number of maps distributed and increase in bus use both follow normal distribution. You can also write down your assumption that our E I error follows normal. Zero comma sigma square. This is how we get our sigma hat square to be this. So this is also our assumption that we should mention. Both are following normal distribution, and error is following normal normal distribution zero comma sigma square. The next part. The equation of the fitted line regression is given. Oh, sorry. Third part. I was reading the second part. The fitted response and the residual. From the regression model uh, fitted in part two are given below. Plot the residual against the value of the fitted response and comment on the adequacy of the model. Now here, what they have done is done is for all the values of x, they found out the y hat values using our equation. Then they have also found out what is the difference between our y and y hat. So that becomes our e hat. Okay. So we have the fitted model as well as error or the residual values. Now we are going to plot these values and then we are going to talk about what does that actually mean. Here I just tried to make a rough model. You should always write down all your values whenever you are making a graph. Make sure your scales. Are exactly the same. That means the difference between this 80 and 100, 100 and 120, 120 to 140 should be same. Here also same. Other than that, 
it does not really matter much your accuracy of these points can be a little bit up or down does not really matter because whenever we are going to see a graph we are going to just mention just look at the graph and mention about the relationships so uh, now here you should again write down your values and try to make it as accurate as possible don't go for each and every point to be very accurate it can be a little bit up or down does not really matter much now what does this plot actually tell us now whenever we are having a, a regression line okay so if my points are something like this so my regression lines are going to be either like this or like this depending on whether we are talking about x on y or y on x so what happens is let's say i have this particular value or this particular line i'll just remove this one so you'll find that there are some values that are lower to this particular regression line and there are some values that are above to this particular line but always it will go from either lower to up or up to down that means your points either will have first negative as your residual value and then it increases and goes positive or the other way around it will be either positive first and then the negative only then the linear relationship is a better model for this particular term but here when we actually now this fit regression line is nothing but r uh, sorry the fitted value or you might say the y hats that is represented by this regression line and this difference is represented by our residual points so here i have mentioned residual points here i have mentioned the uh, fitted values so my depending on my fitted values my regression points first are increasing and then decreasing so you might say there are some positive values and there are some negative values that will always be there but the uh, positive values should be on extreme one side and negative values should be on the extreme other side only then our linear model will be more accurate than any other correlation model so whenever you have such values such that first there were negative values then some positive then some negative values or the other way around positive values then negative then positive values that just means that your model is going to be more accurate if you use some curved uh, relationship now we have not studied any curved relationship we are never going to study any curved relationship throughout our course so you don't have to worry about it but whenever you do not have that kind of a relation between our residual values and our fitted values such that it is going from one side being negative to positive or positive to negative then a linear model is not a very good representation of this you know whatever relationship that we are talking about so they are saying comment on the adequacy of the model so you might say that this a linear regression model might not be very adequate because let's say a um, quadratic model will be more accurate okay so you don't have to know that quadratic model would be more accurate or a cubic model will be more accurate or anything you just say that linear mo model might not be uh, more accurate because negative values are on the both sides of this particular relationship now the fourth part a new city is added to the study and 250000 maps are distributed to the citizen calculate the prediction of the increase in bus use in this city according to the model fitted in part 2 and comment on the validity of the prediction so basically they are saying 250 maps because those values were in thousands so 250 more maps uh, 250 maps have been added to our model they are saying calculate the prediction of increase in the bus use in this city according to the model fitted in part 2 so basically we have the line equation that is y is equals to minus 1.816 plus 0.04348 
x, you will put the value of x here, get the value of your y hat, so that becomes your answer, okay. And then they are asking you to comment on the validity of this prediction. So you will say ki most probably this is not a very accurate value because the linear model is not a very good representation of this particular data. Now you can just see here, you can see that there is slight curvature. So if our line is trying to fit like this, even then a value that is beyond this particular value that is to 250 is going to give us much higher value than it actually might be because this particular curve is looking like it is going in this particular direction. So you can see as you go further the difference might increase much more in this particular model. So these kind of values where we are going beyond our particular model. These are called as extrapolated values. So you have two reasons. First of all, this model might not be a very good fit. Let's say if I had a value somewhere here, 150 or something, I would have got that it is this particular value. The difference between this particular value, the error might be less than in somewhere here 250 where my difference will be much higher. So therefore, what we say is because we are using an extrapolated value and the uh, uh, relationship seems to be a curved one or quadratic relationship, therefore this particular value or this particular prediction will not be that accurate. In a laboratory experiment, a response variable y is thought to be affected by, the con by a quantitative factor x okay the experiment involves making four observations of y at each of the four values of x being these particular values the resulted uh, the result and resulted in the following observation uh, observed response data these data are analyzed by two statisticians a and b who who use an analysis of variance approach and a linear regression approach so first now Basically, these are combining both our approaches. One is analysis of variance, the other is linear regression. So you might say this is a question that is combining both of our chapters. So the first approach is one way analysis that is our ANOVA. So you can see for the A part, they have given you all those values of Y and then uh, first A says apply a one-way analysis I told you whenever you see the word one-way analysis of variance or the word ANOVA that is nothing but our ANOVA chapter um, apply the one-way analysis of variance of these data and obtain the resulting F value uh, for the usual test now F value that is the same value that we calculate as F observed value and the same thing that is why they have written F value you can see the next B part show that the p value of the test is substantially less than 0 0.01 by referring to the table of the percentage point for the f distribution. So, anyways, after that, we are going to find the p value for our f value. So, what we have to do is they have given us summation y and stuff. We have to make our ANOVA table. For ANOVA table, we have to find our SS values. If you want to find our SS values, we have to use these values. So use your formulas from the table book. I'll directly write down these values. So this is our values. Now what do we have to do? We have to make our ANOVA table. So the degree of freedom between treatments. There are four categories here, four treatments, so K minus one, so it becomes three. The total number of values we have 16 values, four for each of them, so N minus K becomes 12 and total will be 15.
you can write f observed or you can write f value because that is what they have asked you can just write f does not really matter that turns out to be uh, always write down your test statistic don't forget that So this becomes our f observed. Now they are saying show that the p value is less than one percent. So basically, or I guess less than one, less than zero point zero one. That is less than one percent. Now we know that we don't have uh, you know many different values. What we can do is we can go to our tables. Go to our f values. In your f tables, if you see that one percent point uh, for the f distribution, and for three comma twelve, try to find the value three comma twelve. We are going to get five point nine five three. So f one percent comma three comma twelve is. Five point nine five three. So for one percent is five point five nine three, and f observed is much larger than that. You can write probability or p value is equals to probability our f three comma twelve is greater than our f observed. Therefore, p value. Is less than zero point zero one, or you can say it is substantially less than because this is a really large value than this five point nine three nine five three. So here we can say that our H naught is rejected. What was our H naught? H naught is that our mu one equal to mu two equal to mu three is equal to mu four. So anyways that. That means there is a substantial difference between each and every value, or some of the values. That is what our conclusion is. So you might say that our x is affecting our y a lot, because at different values of x, we are getting separate different values of y. So the next part says the result of part B above show that shows that there is a very strong evidence of an effect. On y, due to the quantitative factor x, suggest a suitable diagram that the statistician A could now use to describe the effect of x on y. Draw the diagram and hence comment on the effect of x on y. So you might say that we can draw a scatter plot. A scatter plot means we'll draw x and y together. So we'll have x here, we'll have y here. Draw the scatter plot. Now we want this is the kind of graph we are going to get. Now we want to comment on uh, the effect of x on y. Now, as the values of x increases, first the value of y increased, then it became constant, then decreased. So you might say there's a curved relationship. This is not a linear relationship. So basically, we'll say it is some kind of curved relationship between x and y. D part, the graph below shows the residual plot against the value of x. Comment briefly on the implications of this graph. So we have the residual plots. Now, the residual. What does residual plot actually tells us? Residual means it will be y minus y. Uh, you know, y of all first category minus the y bar we are going to get from the first category. Similarly for the second, third, and fourth. So for all treatment, they are finding the difference between each value and its mean, and that becomes our residual values. So these four values, what does that tell us? Now, first of all, we took two assumptions. We said that uh, our all values of y should be following a normal distribution, and secondly, that the variance of each of those values is going to be same. 
so first of all just by looking at the residual plot can we talk about whether they are following normal or not so does that does each uh, plot look like it is very much symmetric so yes so that is why we'll say that they are following normal distribution and secondly whether the variance look pretty similar so you can see that there are more they are more or less the variance is variance is going to be same so therefore we can say that the assumptions that we took that each value is following normal distribution and uh, the variance of each treatment is equal uh, seems to be correct statistician b's approach statistician b's approach is uh, uh, he is going to do linear regression model so you are given the following data perform the linear regression and uh, linear regression analysis on these data to show that the fitted line is given by this particular value so we have to find alpha and beta to find alpha and beta you will have to find your s x x s y y s x y so we'll find our values we'll find our beta we'll find our alpha and we are getting that our regression line then write your regression line and that's it now the next part perform the hypothesis test on the slope coefficient so they have given us our h not that is beta is equal to 0 versus our h1 that is our beta is not equal to 0 showing that the p value is greater than 0.2 comment on what this implies about the relationship between x and y and similarly we'll just see the uh, okay c part is a little bit different so uh, we have to perform our test we know what kind of test we have we have our beta hat minus beta by under root of sigma hat square by s x x follows t n minus 2 so we have our beta hat you can find your sigma hat square again the formula is given in our table formula book s x x we have that you can easily find your t then you can use that t observed to find your p value again whenever we are talking about not equal to our p value will be two times probability that our t n minus 2 in this particular case is greater than mod of t observed this becomes our p value then uh, all we have to show is that the p value is greater than 0.2 so first find this particular value it is between this particular value and that particular value or just show that this is greater than 0.1 therefore two times will be greater than 0.2 then comment on what this implies about the relationship between x and y so if our p value is greater than 0.2 that means at 5% level it will be accepted even at 10% level it will be accepted so therefore we are saying that our beta is equal to 0 that means there is no linear relationship between x and y c part the graph below shows the residual plot against the value of x comment briefly uh residual plot plotted against the values of x comment on uh, briefly on what this graph implies about the effects of x on y now again the same thing we can see that the residual values first there are negative values then there are positive values and then again negative values so we can clearly say that the relationship is non linear or you can say a curved linear relationship oh, sorry curved relationship suggest an additional analysis uh, statistician b could use to describe the effects of x on y so that is what our linear uh, relationship would be that he'll use some kind of curved relationship 
for our next question an analysis of variance uh, investigation with the samples of size 8 for each of four treatments results in the following ANOVA table calculate the observed F statistic specify an uh, interval in which the resulting P value lies state your conclusion clearly so they have given us the ANOVA table so they have done the major part in this particular question we have to find our F observed our F observed will be our MSS B by our M S S R that is eighteen point six six. Then we from our tables we can find F one percent, comma three, comma twenty eight. This is our n minus k sorry k minus 1 and this is our n minus k will be equal to 4.568 so definitely our p value is much less than our uh, you know 1% because our f observed is much greater than our f that we found in this 1% region so you can say our p value is less than 0 0.01 so what do we have you can say that hence we have sufficient evidence to reject H0 therefore there's a difference between the underlying treatments next part the four treatment means are given so we have our y bar 1 y bar 2, y bar 3 and y bar 4 and calculate the least significant difference between the pair of mean using the using a 5% significance list the mean in order illustrate uh, the non-significant pair using substantial uh, subtle suitable sorry suitable underlining and comment briefly so they have given us our y bar, y bar values just by looking at it we can uh, place them in the ascending orders or descending order I'll, I always like descending order so our y bar 4 then 1 then 2 then 3 now we have to find the least significant value Now for this particular case, you can see that sample size 8 for each of the four treatments. So our N1 equal to N2 is equal to N3 is equal to N4 that is equal to 8. So therefore, our least significant value that is our T 5% comma N minus K um, then sigma hat under root 1 by n1 plus 1 by n2 or I can say 1 by na 1 by nb for any values of a and b our na and nb are going to be same so we don't have to calculate our least significant value for each of the pair separately so we have to calculate it only once so you can say your least significant value is equal to this and you'll have to find your sigma hat sigma hat is nothing but 1 by n minus k into s s s r basically our sum of square of residual values divided by n minus k should give you your sigma hat square actually this is sigma hat square you can put your sigma hat here your least significant value
So you'll get least significant value to be 11.2. Now we have to list the mean in such a way that we can tell whether there's a difference between our means or not. So you'll find your y bar 4 minus y bar 1. So y by 4 minus y bar 1. is 10.5 y bar 4 minus y bar 2. Now you can see that our y bar 4 minus y bar 1 is less than our least significant value. That is why there is no difference between 4 and 1. So if there is no difference between 4 and 1, I will also check whether there is a difference between 4 and 2 or not. So that is why I took y bar 4 minus y bar 2. If I would have got that this 10.5 is greater than our least significant value, then I would not have checked for 4 and 2. Because if there is a difference between 4 and 1, there is a definitely there will be a difference between 4 and 2. So therefore, the, for only this particular question, because our NA and NB, that means for number of terms in each and every category or our treatments, was same that is why we had only one least significant value because wherever you put a value as 4 and b as 1 or 1 and 2 or 3 or 4 or any such values these terms were the same value other than that these two will always remain same so therefore the least significant value for each and every combination turns out to be this same particular value and that is the reason we are not drawing that table that we talked about when we were studying ANOVA. Other than that, if we had different values of NA and NB, we would have drawn that particular table and we would have done this analysis on that particular table. So, y bar 4 minus y bar 2 is I think 19 or 29. Twenty nine. So there's a definite difference between two, four, and two because this value is greater than our least significant value. Then our y bar one and y bar two. We'll check these two also. So these are the differences. So there, there's a definite difference between 1 and 2 because our least significant value was 11.5. This is greater. Then there is no difference between 2 and 3. And there's a definite difference between 1 and 3. You don't have to write that. All you have to do is write down again your greater than value here at the end. So y bar 4 greater than y bar 1 greater than y bar 2 greater than y bar 3 and then mark all those values that are less than the least significant value. So here 4 and 1 we had least significant uh, values were less than our least significant value. Then other than that we had 2 and 3. So these are the only combinations that we have. If by chance we had 4 and 2 also we would have extended this here and then, then we would not have 4 and 3 definitely because our analysis failed. So there is a definite difference between 4 and 3. We would not never check for them. So therefore, this becomes your final answer. So again, find your least significant value. Then write down your all combinations of Y bars and then draw this particular diagram. You don't have to write anything else. 
So our next question reads, a bank has a free telephone number for its customer service department. Often the call volume is heavy and customers are placed on hold until a staff member is available to answer. The bank hopes that the caller remains on hold until the call is answered so as not to upset or lose an existing or potential customer. A survey was conducted to analyze whether callers would remain on hold longer on average uh, if they hear if they heard a recorded message containing an advertisement about the bank's products easy listening music or C is classical music the bank randomly selected the sample of five answered calls under each recorded messages and the length of time in minutes that the caller remained on hold before hanging up is given in the table below. Let mu a mu b mu c denote the mean telephone holding time under the recorded message a b c. First, perform an analysis of variance to test the hypothesis that the nature of the recorded message has no effect on the length of the time that the caller remain on hold. You should construct an appropriate ANOVA table and state your conclusion. So the question is pretty much very simple. You have to do your ANOVA analysis. Then we'll just go to the B part. Calculate a 95% confidence interval for mu A minus mu C using the information available from all three samples. An equivalent approach, no, okay, so B part ends there. So basically, first of all, we are going to do our ANOVA analysis in the A part. And the B part says, calculate a 95% confidence interval for mu A minus mu C under the information available from all three samples. Now, very important, whenever we needed to find confidence interval for mu A, minus mu c or you may say mu 1 minus mu 2 our test statistic was x bar 1 minus x bar 2 or i'll just write a and c here minus this upon we had sp under root of 1 by n a plus 1 by n c follows t n a plus n c minus 2 this was our test statistic now, here, whenever we are going to be concerned with that ANOVA information, the thing is, in this particular term, we calculate our SP using sample variance from A as well as sample variance from C. But here, because we have more information and we have already considered that the variance of A, B and C are equal, that is why we are doing the ANOVA analysis. So if you have already considered that variance of A, B and C are equal, so finding variance using all the values would be more accurate that, than finding uh, variance using only A and C. So therefore, instead of SP, we have sigma hat here and instead of NA my, plus NB minus 2, we have N minus K as R degrees of freedom because that is what sigma hat square gives us the formula for we have 1 minus sorry 1 by n minus k s s r right so basically this particular term comes from our all the particular uh, all the sample values that we have that is from a b and c and we are going to use that as our estimate for our variance because that will be more accurate than using only the values from a and c and you can see in this particular question they have given us using information available from all three samples so we have to use the information available from all three samples wherever we can so of course for x bar a and x bar c we cannot use the sample from all three values because b does not affect x bar a and x bar c n a and n c again b does not affect that but this variance is affected by b also so we'll use that here 
and because we have used sigma hat we get 1 by n minus k therefore our degrees of freedom becomes n minus k here so you'll find your uh, uh, confidence interval now usually what happens is in this type of question where you'll find that they ask you to do an ANOVA analysis and then they ask you to find the confidence interval from the extreme values you'll find that ANOVA analysis was accepted that means we came to a conclusion there's no difference between a b and c but this 95 percent confidence interval will show you that there's a difference between a and c so if our ANOVA an analysis said that there is no difference between a and c then how can we say that there's a difference between a and c in our second analysis there should be a consistency in the analysis that we are using so i think at the end somewhere they will ask us to uh, comment on that even if there is not you might find such questions so why is there a, why there might be a difference between a and c when anova said that there was no difference between a b and c because in anova what we are doing is let's say we have a b and c the mean for a mean for b and mean for c from our samples and our overall mean is let's say somewhere here okay so we are in ANOVA we are comparing each and every mean with this overall mean so what happens is we are comparing the difference between overall mean and A overall mean and C there is a chance that there is no significant difference between these two values and these two values but there is still a significant difference between A and C. So that is the reason we might get that our ANOVA says that there is no difference between A, B and C. But our confidence interval shows us that there is a difference between A and C. How does a confidence interval show us that? Because it does not include the value 0 in that confidence interval. See is equal to zero when the confidence interval does not include that particular value we know that val probability also if you are testing for five percent then there's a five percent chance that even though our confidence interval shows that zero is not included still there will be a five percent chance that mu a minus mu c will be zero that is what we studied in type one error and type two error right so anyways that will never be asked that how much chance is there that it will still be included that will be framed in a different way that is our type 1 error and type 2 error questions in these particular questions that, that will never be asked for the next part they are saying an equivalent approach for analyzing the effect of the recorded recorded messages on holding time is the following now consider the regression model expected value of y to be equal to a plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 now that means here our y is dependent on two different values of x's now where yi is the telephone holding time and xi1 and xi2 are the indicator variables such that xi1 equal to 1 if the message is the message for caller contains uh, an advertisement and zero otherwise and for two they are saying equal to one if the message contains easy listening music otherwise zero the results from the fitted uh, fitting this model are given below now see they have given us coefficients of intercept x1 and x2 that means intercept is nothing but our a and coefficient of x1 and x2 are nothing but b1 and b2 then they have given us the standard error that is going to be nothing but their variances then t value becomes uh, let's say of analysis the analysis we do do on beta similarly we'll do analysis on b1 and b2 so we get t values for those and then t values accordingly from those t values 
they have also given us as R S as well as R R square. Using the fitted model, calculate the predicted value for the telephone holding time when the message contains classical music. Now, when the message contains classical music, we know there is no advertisement and there is no easy listening music. That means our x i one is equal to zero and our x i two is also equal to zero. Now, if both of them are zero. Our model becomes our expected value of y i will be equal to nothing but a. So therefore, um, it is ten point four. So we need to wait ten averagely ten point four, whatever I guess minutes they are saying. Then test the hypothesis uh, h naught. That is b1 is equal to zero against b1 not equal to zero at the five percent level of significance. For this, what would we do? We have our test statistics that beta hat minus beta upon under root of sigma hat square by s x x follows t n minus two. This is our test statistic that we actually use to find. Now here we don't have to use this. Why? Because they have given us the value of t as well as they have given us the p value. Now our level of significance is five percent. So we can directly check whether our p value is less than five percent or whether it is greater than five percent. Here it is three point nine percent. So that means definitely for b one. The p value is such that our h naught is rejected, hence b one not equal to zero. So that becomes our test of hypothesis. All you can show is p value for b one is equal to three point nine percent, hence at five percent level of significance we reject h naught. Therefore, b one is equals to or not equals to zero. C part derive an expression relating b one with Mu mu a is and mu c, and hence verify your result from the test in second b uh, using the confidence interval obtained in first b. For that, first of all, we'll see how we can relate our b one with mu a and mu c. Now we know that when we have um, we had what. Three values. We let's say we have advertisement. So if we have advertisement, we get that our y hat or expected value the same thing. This is what we are going to get. So I'm saying y hat will be equal to a plus. First of all, okay, write it for advertisement. For advertisement, what will be our x one and x two? So our x i one. Is equals to one, and our x i two is equals to zero. So our y hat becomes a plus b one x i one. And similarly, for for uh, what is the second one? Let's say for this particular term, what was it? That was for classical music. So for classical music, our y hat becomes a. So here, if we take our expected value. Expected value when we are talking about advertisement of y hat will be nothing but mu a advertisement will be equal to a plus b one because our x one is nothing but one and here for classical music our expected value will be mu c that will be classical music that becomes just a 
I can subtract these two. So I get my B1 to be mu A minus mu C. So if B1 is equal to mu A minus mu C and if I have to do any kind of analysis here, I can do the analysis only on mu A minus mu C. So we have to do what kind of analysis? Uh, derive an expression relating B1 with mu A, my, mu A and mu C. So we got that. Hence verify your result from test in 2B. Our test in 2B was that our H0 B1 is equal to 0. H1 that our B1 not equal to 0. So you can say our H0 here becomes mu A minus mu c equals to 0 and mu a minus mu c not equal to 0. From our confidence interval, I will just write down the confidence interval. Our confidence inter 95% confidence interval for mu a minus mu c was minus 9.694 comma minus 0 0.306. This was our confidence interval that we found out in the previous question. So now here you can see clearly that our value 0 in mu a minus mu c is not included. That means there is a very little chance that these values are going to be zeros that is mu a minus mu mu c is equals to 0 or you can say at 5% significance you can you don't have to show your test statistic and then solve it we can just look here and we can say that therefore 95% confidence interval for b1 is equals to is minus 9.694 comma minus 0 0.306 you can say therefore H0 is rejected or we have sufficient evidence to reject H0 at 5% level. Now coming back to that table, you might find this particular kind of table many times given in your question for correlation and regression. Now that table will always write the coefficients, the standard error, the T value, the P value and below they will give you your S and they will give you your R square. Now, even though th this is a standard kind of table, okay. So, even though in this particular question we ne did not require our standard error at all, as well as we did not require our t values, even if they just gave us the p value, that would have been good enough. But, and also the r square and stuff. But what happens is, this is a standard form of table that you will find. So many times we'll use a particular value from the table, many times we'll not use any of these values. So therefore, this table is given sometimes in these kind of questions. Sometimes they'll ask you how good your, uh, you know, this particular regression equation is, how good of a fit it is or how good is your regression analysis. So here they have given us our R square. R square tells us how good of a fit our regression line is to our data. So here you can see it is 51.7% R square. That is also called as coefficient of determination. So that R square is really low 51.7%. So you'll say it's not a very good fit. Now you can use this to find your small r also. You can just root this value and you'll get your small r. So if small r is required, that is given. Now, uh, other than that, I have not seen these kind of tables or these values used any other way. So you will be using either the t values or your p values, your coefficient values. Now many times when you have a normal regression line that is only one y and only one x, this kind of table is still given. So that means you will have the values of your alpha and your beta in that coefficient ones. 
you will have the t value for your beta if you are doing the analysis you will have your p value for the beta if you will, if you are doing the analysis we have never done any kind of analysis on alpha so that t value and p value for alpha does not really matter so other than that not much is used in this particular table You can also use your standard error to find either your sigma hat square or SXX for beta. So standard error of beta is nothing but under root of sigma hat square by SXX. But as I told you, I have never seen a question that will that will require to use that particular term. So remember, if you have this kind of a table where intercept X and then coefficient um, standard error t value p value are given so usually we require only the t value p value or maybe the coefficient values or maybe the r square value